Outside the doors of this church, the air is full of despair and fear and tension. But as soon as I walk into this building, I feel comfort. The comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen? The marvelous comfort of the Holy Spirit. Where do people go who don't have the Lord? Where do they go? How, what despair? What despair? Uh, in the schools, in business, and all throughout this country and even around the world in these very troubled times. What a rock we have. What a place. Folks, probably the, the, the most rewarding thing of all is that we have a word that is true and unshakable. In these times, we don't have to guess. We don't have to imagine. We have a sure word foundation. You need to get the two tapes from previous services, Pastor Carter this morning and Sister Teresa this afternoon, some very powerful messages. And uh, if you miss that, make sure you, you get those tapes. A very, very important word that the Lord has brought forth today. Tonight, I want to minister. To, uh, we're going to go to prayer after we preach, after I preach tonight, because there are a lot of things to pray about. As you know, now the war has started. The bombing is underway even while I stand here. And uh, <clears throat> we, we have a lot to talk about tonight. And I, I hope that when you leave here, you leave with a hope, a great hope that God has everything under control. My message tonight, touch not mine anointed. Touch not my anointed. Do my prophets no harm, but touch not my anointed. This is a warning. It's a warning. It's a warning for President Bush. It's a warning to Congress. It's a warning to the church. And who am I to give anybody a warning? I'm just saying what the word says. At least you'll hear it. Uh, and uh, folks, by the way, the word being preached in the pulpit is being heard. The Washington Times carried a good portion of my message, the towers are falling. And if congressmen read the Washington Times, they got the message. Psalms 105. Let's begin to read at verse 8. Psalms 105, verse 8. Touch not mine anointed. Psalms 105, verse 8. He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham in his oath unto Isaac, and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. Now listen to this. It's an everlasting covenant. And what is that covenant about? Saying unto thee will I give the land of Canaan, the lot of your inheritance, when they were but a few men in number, yea, very few, and strangers in it. When they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another, he suffered or allowed no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, Touch not mine anointed, do my prophets no harm. Heavenly Father, we have a word that is everlasting. We don't have to stumble for truth. We don't have to look for it in odd places. We don't have to listen to the reports that come to us. We don't build our hope on anything but your word. And I thank you for this word, this living word of God. And Lord, it's going to become more and more precious. As we see things happening, they're causing men's hearts to fail them for fear. Jesus, you said that exactly what's going to happen. We have arrived at that time you warned us of. All men's hearts, failing them for fear of seeing those things coming upon the nations. No, oh God, at that very same time, you have given your church a sure word. And Lord, in the days to come, your word is going to come forth clear. It's going to come forth powerful. It's going to come forth, O oh Lord, with your voice. It's going to come forth, Lord, to encourage us, to build us in the faith, that you will have a people in these last days who are not shaken by any events. But we are on a rock. And we are solid with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Touch not mine anointed. Do my prophets no harm. Now this is a powerful warning from Almighty God. And he means every word that he said. He means every word of this warning. Any nation or any man who lays a hand on his anointed or chosen by God. He said, woe to that individual, woe to that nation. 
Now, there's a dual application to this warning from our Heavenly Father. It refers to both natural Israel and to spiritual Israel. The New Testament spiritual Israel is called Zion, representing the overcoming church of Jesus Christ. Now, the context of this covenant that God made with natural Israel has to do with the land. It was a land, it's a land covenant. I just read to you in verse uh, Verse 10, and he confirmed the same unto Jacob. Jacob is synonym for Israel, for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying, Unto thee, Israel, will I give the land of Canaan, that's Israel, the lot of your inheritance. Now, God said, listen close now, that he purchased this land with his right hand. You'll find that in Psalm 78, 54. He said, He cast out the heathen also before them. You'll find that in verse 54 also, in Psalm 78. The Bible says that God himself majored the land, his inheritance for Israel. He set the borders from Jordan to the sea. Now, the Bible says very clearly that God took a measuring line, as if he stood on one of the mountains and he looked out, and God himself, by spirit, measured so many miles this way, so many miles north, so many miles east and south. The borders of the Mediterranean Sea. This border, he, he lined, he said he measured it by light. God himself measured the land. North, south, east, and west, God made the map and said, this is the inheritance for my people, Israel. He gave it as a permanent covenant land grant. It was made to the natural seed of Abraham is to Israel. Now Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt to the land that God had mapped out and he said this is the promised land and I give it to you. And at God's command the wicked were driven out of Canaan and they possessed what God gave them as a land grant, the promised land. And God put a distinction on these people. He said they were a chosen people, consecrated, anointed. And he called Moses a prophet. Pro Moses himself acknowledged, he said, there will come forth a prophet like unto me. He was speaking of Christ. He said, you will hear him. Now here's a land that's been measured by God. Here's a, man that, here's a land that God said he has purchased with his own right hand. He measures it. And God allowed no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, Touch not my anointed, do my prophets no harm. Now the context of this is Israel and a land grant. Now we use this often for ministers saying, Don't touch a minister, don't touch God's anointed, don't touch his, uh, his prophets, that's fine. But the, the context of this is natural Israel. These are my anointed, this is my chosen people. Don't touch their landmarks. Don't do any harm to my people. Now Moses, a prophet, said in Deuteronomy 32, 8, The Most High set the boundaries of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. He said, this is going to be the seed of my church. This is, this is the Old Testament church, and out of it will come the New Testament church. These were the borders. And God put all mankind on notice. From the time that I chose this people to be my portion, I anointed them. I consecrated them as my people. I have never and will never allow any man or any nation to do them harm. I will not permit any of them to touch my prophets. Now you say, but the Jews have been persecuted. They have been harmed all over the world. But what God is saying, you harm my people at great cost to you. It'll cost you everything you touch my people. You harm Israel, and it's going to cost you. Now, this is the warning I believe that we need to hear in this land. And I'm not preaching politics tonight. I'm preaching the word of God. Do not touch or harm Israel. Do not touch its borders that I myself have measured. No matter what your politics may be, folks, no matter what you think of the Jew. 
God help the man, God help the nation that harms or touches its borders. Now you may touch them, you may harm them, you may put them in gas ovens like Hitler did. But I want you to know he paid a price when Germany was destroyed, when Germany was bombed to the ground and lay in ruins. I hear it again ring in my ears, touch not my anointed, do my prophets no harm. Now this brings me to a matter that I said this morning chills me to the bone. Because in the the White House, there are, are now Arab sympathizers. And the President of the United States this past week spoke on his national radio program the possibility of the United States coming out for the establishment of the Palestinian state. And the Palestinians have made it clear if they have the state and the ground that they asked for carved out of Israel's land, they want East Jerusalem as their capital. Now listen closely, please. That I'm not against the Palestinian state, and I'm not preaching politics, but if there should be a Palestinian state, it should be in Jordan. And God help America. God help the President of the United States. If he changes, the United States has been a friend of Israel, from the very beginning. And God said to Abraham, those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. And mostly the reason America has been blessed and prospered to this time has been because they have been on the side of Israel. Been Israel's number one protector in the world. Standing against the whole world with Israel. And now in one week, the Prime Minister of Israel voiced what every Jew is feeling right now. We have been betrayed. We have been abandoned. But if we have to, we'll stand up against all our neighbors and God will be with us. This is not a political matter. This is a biblical matter. This is a spiritual matter. All of this is being done to form a coalition among the Arabs to stand with the war on terrorism. Now, folks, listen closely. This is a prophetic word of the Lord that is probably uh, more vital than anything I've spoken this pulpit. I have a, a grief in my heart beyond anything I've ever known. And it's, I believe it's the very grief of the heart of God. Because even in evangelical churches now, we have ministers standing in the pulpit saying, God gave up on Israel. Israel's nothing but a baloney, a, a baloney uh, country. Full of baloney. Those are the very words of one preacher. And this anti-Semitism is creeping into the church of Jesus Christ. Very dangerous. I can tell you folks, one of the reasons, one of the prime reasons that this church and our ministry is debt free and is blessing people around the world is one of the strongest missionary giving churches in the United States. All our properties, free and clear, is because we've stood with Israel and we've built a church in the Holy Land. This could bring a reproach and a curse on our nation. Leaders in Israel feel abandoned because of the dangerous advice now being given our president. I want you to turn to Isaiah 54. A warning for the prophet Isaiah. Verse 15. Here's a prophecy about <clears throat> nations gathering together against Israel and the church. It has a dual application. Verse 15, Behold, they shall surely gather together. In other words, they'll come against you. 
but not by me. God says, that's not my direction. I'm not giving anyone spiritual direction in that direction. Whoever shall gather together against thee shall what? Fall for thy sake. Now let me address this matter of God having given up on Israel. Why don't you go to Hosea. Folks, look at me, please. You're going to hear this. In fact, I, there are some of you listening to me now. They have a problem with Jews. You have a problem with Israel. A few years ago, about ten years ago, one of our staff members went to Israel and come back and complained. Nothing but a dry piece of land. I felt nothing. I don't care about Israel. That staff member, of course, didn't last very long after that. Not for that reason alone, but the attitude. And, and you've heard preachers say that God has given up on Israel. God, the only thing now is a spiritual Israel. We are the sons of Abraham. Yes, but God has not given up on a land contract, a land covenant with Israel. That is to preserve Israel until that day that he would come in a revelation. He's coming back, he said, to set his feet on the Mount of Olives. And the Arabs are not going to be in control when he does it. I want to deal with this issue. Go to Hosea, the ninth chapter, please. I want to show you where they get this, that God has given up on Israel. You need your Bible tonight. Ninth chapter. Let's start with verse 1, Hosea. Ninth chapter. And here's where they get it, that God has given up Israel. Rejoice not, O Israel. Verse 1. For joy as other people. Rejoice not, O Israel, for joy like other people. For thou hast gone a whoring from thy God. Thou hast loved the reward upon every quarter. Verse 11. As for Ephraim, another synonym for Israel, their glory shall fly away like a bird from the birth and from the womb and from the conceptions. Though they bring up their children, yet will I bereave them that there shall not be a man left. Yea, woe also to them when I depart from them. Verse 15. All their wickedness is in Gilgal, for there I hated them. For the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more, for the princes are revolters. Ephraim is smitten, their root is dried up, they shall bear no fruit. Yea, though they bring forth, yet will I slay even the beloved fruit of their womb. My God will cast them away, because they did not hearken unto me. And they shall be wonders among the nations. <clears throat> Turn left all the way to first chapter of Hosea. Now that sounds like God gave up on Israel and they, they, these are just some of the scriptures that they use. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter uh, 1 verse 4. And the Lord said unto him, call his name Jezreel. For yet a little while I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu and will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. I'll, I'll cause to cease. I'll, I'll destroy it. Verse 9. Then said God, call his name Loami, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. These are some of I want you to go now. Uh, let, let me give you uh, Jeremiah 30, verse 12, where God calls Israel's wound incurable. And they say if it's incurable, it's incurable. God could not cure Israel. Now, let me show you how wrong that is. Hosea, the 11th chapter. 11th chapter of Hosea. For those who say God gave up on Israel. Verse 11, uh, chapter, ver chapter 11, Hosea, starting at verse 7. And my people are bent to backsliding from me. Though they called them to the Most High, none of them would exalt him. Now listen to this. How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Adma? How shall I set thee as Zeboim? These are nations that he destroyed. My heart is turned within me. My repentings are kindled together. Go to chapter 14. You see God repenting here of those thoughts against Israel. Chapter 14 of Hosea. Verse 4. I will what? Heal their backsliding. I will what? Love them freely for my anger is turned away from him. Verse 8, and this ties it to Israel. Ephraim shall say, what have I to do anymore with idols? 
I've heard him and observed him. I'm like a green fir tree. From me is thy fruit found. Who is wise? He shall understand these things prudent. He shall know them for the ways of the Lord are right. The just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall therein. God is in the last day talk, has promised to reveal himself as the Messiah to the Jewish nation. And those who turn to him, they have to come through the blood. They can't come through a sacrifice. They can't come through the temple. They have to come through faith in Jesus Christ. And he shed blood just like you and I. But there will be a revelation to the Jewish nation before the end. Remember what Paul said. Verse chapter, you turn, don't turn there, Romans 11, verses 1 and 2. Paul said, hath God cast away his people? He's talking about his natural descendants. Hath God cast away his people? God forbid. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. All right, that's natural Israel. Now, folks, we need to pray. You need to pray, as I've been praying this past week. And you need to be praying, oh, God. And Pastor Carter led us in prayer this morning, oh, God. Confuse the counsel of those who are advising the president to do this and ask God to bring forth a sound in Washington, D.C. from those who know the scripture, those who may be hidden in office. God, bring them out into the light and get his ear. And God, speak to him any way you want. Don't let one inch of Israel be given away. Not one inch of Israel's land to be discarded. Not one inch of it. Now, there's not politics. I say it again. That's the word of God. But you see, I said that there's a dual application to that scripture. Touch not mine anointed, do my prophets no harm. He's also talking about Zion. Now, Zion, by the prophet Isaiah, was called the called out church, the heavenly Jerusalem. Zion, he said, was called forth by the Redeemer, by the Redeemer. That could be only Christ. Isaiah ties Zion to the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, which is Christ. Now, what's God's concern in the world today? In light of what happened, what is God's concern about America? What's God focused on now? What is the focus of our Almighty God? His one great concern on the earth today is Zion, his church. And God relates to nations only as it relates to his church. Nothing concerns God other than how it affects his church. I'm going to prove that to you. I didn't get an amen there, but I'm going to prove that to you. His focus is not on the corrupt church. Not on the backslidden church. That's not his focus. His focus is on the redeemed, the overcomer. Those who are totally devoted to Jesus Christ and have wholly given themselves to him. That invisible, anointed body all over the world. That is his concern. That is his focus today. Is God concerned about the war on terrorism? Is he concerned with America's prosperity, our future? Let me say it again, only as it affects his divine purposes, eternal purposes, only as it affects his body and what he plans for the future, only as it affects his eternal plans. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket, and they're counted as a small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. Britain is an island. God said, it's a very little thing in my sight. Manhattan is an island. Very little thing in my sight. Listen to this. All nations, including America, all nations. Now, that's not in the Bible. I put that there. But all nations. Listen closely. All nations before him are as nothing. They are counted to him as less than nothing. And vanity. To whom then will you liken God? How are you going to compare God to all the nations in the world combined? He said, they're not but a drop in the bucket. My eternal concern is for the lost in this world. His concern in those nations and how his church will reach those. It all has to do with Zion. has to do with his church. Balaam 
prophesied of Israel. He said, they, God's people, shall dwell alone. They shall not be re reckoned among the nations. He looked down over that people. He, he, he said, that's God's whole concern on earth. There are all the heathen nations to the north, even China at that time, and all the multitudes. It's only, his only concern was how would he get missionaries out there, and how does he reach the lost, and how does he get people to respond. His concern is not the Roman Empire and all of its, all of its armies and all of its wealth. His concern is not at this time for all the nations surrounding Israel, Africa, and Ethiopia. Everything in time of Christ was focused right on little Israel. And even here, now it's focused. And that little group in the valley, his whole focus is there. And Balaam says, they aren't even numbered among the nations. They're not numbered. They're a nation within a nation within a nation. And folks, that's what the church of Jesus Christ is. The body of Christ the real church made up of every denomination where there are hungry people calling on the name of the Lord. That is his concern. That is his focus. We are not even numbered with the nations. We are separated people, the Bible says. When it says we're peculiar people, it doesn't mean crazy. It means consecrated, anointed. We're an anointed people who are followers of Jesus Christ, devoted to him. In other words, we're not numbered with the nation. God says, your concern is not what's going out there. Your concern now is to know my eternal purposes and fulfill them. When God honors a nation or when God curses a nation, when he brings them down, it's according to the way they have dealt with his beloved people, his anointed God's only concern for Egypt had to do with the way they were treating his people. That's the only concern that God had for Egypt. You say, well, God, God doesn't love the people. Oh, yes, he loves the people of the nations. But only as they respond. He's, he talked about the responding to the gospel or the message that he has brought to them. They touched God's anointing in Egypt. And God drowned their armies in the sea. He devastated the nation because they touched God's anointed. Moses was a prophet. They touched God's anointed. God's only concern for the great Babylonian empire had to do with how they threatened his anointed with extinction during the time of Esther. Balaam stands to literally destroy... God's anointed and his prophet Mordecai. And God did not destroy the Babylonian Empire because of their idolatry alone. He didn't do it because of their sensuality. He did it because they touched something that was holy. They took the drinking cups out of the golden drinking cups out of the temple of Jerusalem and they had a drunken party and they picked up those consecrated vessels and began to drink it. That night God said, you touched my anointing, you did my prophet's arm, that's it. That night they were destroyed. Why? Because they touched God's anointed. God's focus on the earth, his eternal purposes. The moment man encroaches on God's interest, God is moved to destroy. I'll tell you, God will maintain a quarrel with the whole world to preserve his church and to preserve his people. He'll maintain a quarrel with the whole world. He'll stretch out his hand of judgment on all sides to save, his, to save and prosper the plan that he has given to us in eternity before the world began by covenant. The Roman Empire was cast down because it rose up to kill and annihilate true believers. Ten persecutions under the Roman Empires. And Diocletian, one of the worst, became a madman. He went insane simply because, and this is recorded in history, simply because the more, Christ, more believers he killed, the more rapidly they grew. He tried to destroy 
the believers. He tried to destroy the, the ministry of Jesus Christ, the work of Jesus Christ on earth. And he had to give up. He abdicated, in fact, his throne because he, was, he turned insane because he couldn't kill it. In Genesis, the 20th chapter, there's a great king by the name of Abimelech. And he took Sarah, Abram's wife, into his harem. Now, folks, this, she's God's anointed. And Abraham's God's anointed. He's a prophet. In the middle of the night, he gets a dream, and God said, Abimelech, you're a dead man. <laughs> That's exactly what the scripture said. You're a dead man. I tell you, that woke him up. <laughs> you're a dead man. Why? Because of the possibility that he could touch God's anointed. And listen to what the scripture says. Restore her to her husband, for he's a prophet. If thou restore her not, know that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that is thine. Folks, these words are, are, are frightening. These words are powerful. What a warning to us and what a warning to America or any other nation that touches God's anointed or, or try to hinder God's eternal purposes. This all has to do with what's happening in the world today because America has been traumatized now by terrorists. The Twin Towers have been obl obliterated. The Pentagon, Pentagon was attacked. Now, what's God's concern in all of this? Boy, you better believe that God grieves over the widows and the fatherless. God destroyed whole nations because they ignored widows and the fatherless. He said he's a father to the fatherless and he's a father to the widows. How he must grieve over that. But you see, God's greatest concern is how the calamity, how these calamities touch and affect Zion, his anointed ones. God never allows anyone, any nation, to sidetrack what he has determined from the foundation of the world. Nothing can hinder, nothing can inter interfere. Everything is going to be on schedule. Folks, no matter what you hear in the days to come, no matter what has happened, God has everything on schedule. Jesus was born on schedule, right on time, that God, the day and the date and hour God set back in eternity. He... They came at him, tried to kill him. Herod killed numbers of innocent children. The devil could not touch this child. God preserved him. Nothing could hinder God's eternal purpose to save the world through the sacrifice of his son. Jesus was crucified on the very hour of the day. He was buried in the third preset day. On schedule. He was resurrected from the grave. And all of the armies of this earth and all the threats and all the terrorism, nothing could hinder God's eternal plan. Nothing. Amen. Glory be to God. Amen. Boy, when you see that and believe it. Jesus ascended to the Father. And before he left, he gave a command to his church. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out the devils, and make converts. Make believers. Make disciples. Now, I will tell you, it may come a time in the United States, they've already outlawed the Bible and prayer in our schools. They've outlawed even the hanging of the Ten Commandments in courts and public buildings. They have outlawed in most parts of the United States even putting up a, a manger scene. And the time is not too far off that they may say, you cannot, you cannot proselytize is the word they use. You can't try to convert anybody outside the door of your church. When Pastor Carter says the time may come when he'd be imprisoned, that could not be too far off. For him and, and other of us that go out on the streets and preach Jesus, the time could come that 
here in the United States, you could go to jail for that very thing. You think that can't happen? You didn't think they'd knock prayer out of the school either, did you, 15 years ago? But after 2,000 years, his truth is still marching on. His anointed Zion is moving on. Folks, uh, uh, just before the afternoon service, I turned on the radio, found out that the bombs were falling in Afghanistan, but they had a, a, a message from Osama bin Laden, and it was being interpreted, and I heard the message. He gave a message, a warning to the United States. He called for every Muslim in the United States to start cutting off heads. He said, what you, what you have uh, received in the way of terror is only the beginning. You haven't seen anything yet. And he said, all Islamics around the world have to know now that this is the, the war of wars. And it's time for every Islamic to arise now and show your faith. But I've got a message for Osama bin Laden. A message from the Church of Jesus Christ in America and around the world. When Osama bin Laden destroyed the Twin Towers here in New York City, he and his ter terrorists began to dance and rejoice. They said jihad, the holy war, had begun. And world leaders began to come to ground zero. United Nations officials, congressmen. I was The, the times I was down there and also with, with Grand... The world leaders were there at the time. Uh, uh, former President Clinton was standing three feet away over here, and other officials from all over the world were coming in, and they were shaking their head in disbelief, and questions were being asked. You know, I believe that the bin Laden and, and the terrorist al-Qaeda al had spies there, and I believe they took reports or got back reports to the terrorists that caused them to dance and rejoice. But all kinds of questions were asked. What impact is this going to have on the country? How long-lasting will the effects be? Will New York ever uh, come back the way it was? And what changes are going to result? Messengers from all over the world pouring into Ground Zero to the, with the mayor here. Folks, there's a, a, a similar situation in Isaiah 14, I want to show it to you. A very similar situation. And a lot of truth can be mined out of this. Isaiah, the 14th chapter. I I'm amazed at how up to date the Bible is. <laughs> more and more. Lord's not been caught off guard. He's never been surprised. Do you think God was taken by surprise? No, 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 no. Now, don't, don't scan the chapter to find out where I'm going. Just open it and leave it on your lap, okay? Let me give you the background of this chapter, please. Listen closely. Judah had just been invaded uh, prior to this chapter by Assyria, and it had been brought low. The scripture said the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel. Ahaz was one of the most wicked kings in Israel's history, for he made Judah naked, and he transgressed sore against the Lord, Second Chronicles 28, 19. Now, at the same time, Philistina, which is uh, Palestine, uh, invaded South Judah and took, uh, I think, at least five of their cities, and they began to devastate. And they, when, when they conquered the southern part, they began to dance and shout. They were rejoicing. In Isaiah 14, chapter, verses 29, Isaiah is sent by God to bring a message to these terrorists. Verse 28, in the year that King Ahaz died was this burden. You see, Ahaz is dead, the wicked king is dead, and because of its sin, God has judged the land. Jerusalem, the crown city of Judah, is in ruins. And now, the Palestinians are rejoicing and dancing in their camps. And here's what the prophet delivered his message. He delivered in verse 29. Rejoice not thou, O Palestina, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. In other words, Judah has defeated you in the past. It was a rod that God used because of your sins against you. But now you see them in ruin 
He said, for out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. The firstborn of the poor shall feed, and the, the needy shall lie down in safety. Now, what he is saying, verse 31, How, O gate, cry, O city, thou whole Palestina, though all of Palestine art dissolved. There shall come from the north a smoke, and none shall be alone in disappointed times. The prophet Isaiah came and said, uh, you better cut, in, in paraphrase, you'd better stop your shouting. Because I'm going to cause Judah to dwell in safety now. And he said, I'm going to totally obliterate. You read the context there. He said he's going to do it through a famine. He's going to do it through a famine. Now, we come to verse 32. Now, listen closely now. There were messengers coming from everywhere to find out the health and the future of Jerusalem. Most of Jerusalem was a crown city at that time. And evidently, messengers were coming from everywhere asking questions. Why would your God allow this? Why would he destroy his own city? Why would God allow this for his people, to his people? And, and what's the future of Jerusalem? Will this city ever rise again from the ashes? And all these questions, evidently government officials, evidently private citizens and others were coming to the prophet saying, what are we going to answer? What are we going to tell him? Hmm. What are we going to tell the people when they ask what's going to happen to America now? What happens if they're more terrorist? What's going to happen? Folks, yes, we weep, we grieve. There's a weeping in my heart all day long. There's a quiet weeping. I have the joy of the Lord, but there's always this quiet weeping inside of my heart because of things that I see coming. And we all have that kind of pain. But folks, there's something you and I have to get a hold of. And we have to get a hold of it tonight. If you get a hold of it now with me through the power of the Holy Ghost, you will go through this with strength and nothing will shake you. Nothing. What God has shown me in this has anchored my soul. And we have to have something that make us unshakable. So that anybody around you that's trembling and everybody in fear when you see these things coming on the earth, you will stand strong and you will have an answer. I give you that answer. God said, go tell the princes and tell the king, tell the people. What shall one then answer the messengers of the nation? Read it. Verse 32. What shall one then answer the messengers of the nations? They come and say what's going to happen. Tell them this. That the Lord hath founded Zion. And the poor of his people shall trust in it. Tell Osama bin Laden. The church of Jesus Christ is alive and well and untouched. Tell the terrorist that all they've done is arouse the sleeping giant. And that's not the armies of the United States. That's the true church of Jesus Christ. You have done nothing but arouse them to pray. And you have equipped us with weapons. You, you, you have, you have uh, urged us to use our weapons. Our weapons are not missiles. Our weapons are not germ warfare. Our weapons are not bombs. We've got weapons that you can't hide from. bombs may miss your hiding place but we have weapons that pull down all strongholds <laughs> folks all over the United States young Christian kids from the Bible school everywhere are lining up now saying I'm going to go to a Muslim country and preach Jesus Pastor Carter, you have a couple ready to go now. 
You know, I've got a question for the terrorists. And I've got a question, a question for Islam. Why didn't the mullahs and the ayatollahs gather all the Islamic young people they could find and train them to come to the United States and all over the world and be missionaries and convert us? <laughs> come on now. What? 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 Why would you have to blow us up? <laughs> what, what, what are you hiding if your religion is so powerful? Folks, I'm, I'm not mocking. I'm telling you now. Listen closely. This is a battle between the devil himself and Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And we better realize that. If those terrorists only knew what they have awakened... Because the true church of Jesus Christ now is praying like it has never prayed. Folks, I'm not, I'm not talking about all of these people who got a two-week religion. And they prayed for two weeks. Some for one week. And now in the schools, they don't even have a moment of silence. They're back to their football games. They're back to their Broadway shows. It's all gone. Uh, and the politicians are back to their arguing and back to their politics. But... And this is the issue. And this is something, glory to be to God, that Isaiah is saying. When anybody asks you what the future for America is, what the future holds for New York, there are churches in this city that are praying and seeking the face of God. And there are thousands in Brooklyn, thousands in here in Manhattan, right at the shadow of the World Towers. And we are aiming our weapons. We're going to pray faith and prayer. Faith and prayer. Secret weapons he knows nothing about. Glory be to God. <laughs> Folks, Christ is God's anointed one. And if the United States of America tries to make him politically incorrect and they keep pressing this issue of taking God out of our society let them take a lesson from history USSR United States of Soviet Russia they tried to burn the Bibles and close the churches and burn them down they took a stand against God and declared that that should be a godless nation they began to torture God's people. They touched God's prophets. And God said, that's enough. And God brought down one of the greatest empires of all time who, who were set to rule the world with all of their mighty missiles. Can you imagine the thousands of missiles that they had? Can you imagine that wall that God tore down? And then Lenin's statue falls on his face and God lays that nation bare, strips it of all of it, almost all of its states. And Russia stands alone now. And folks, God opened it to the gospel. I had the privilege of going. Our people have been there. I've held crusades in Moscow and St. Petersburg, preaching Jesus freely. Jesus Christ won the battle in Russia. You can believe that God is getting set right now to pour missionaries into Afghanistan in a very short time. God will open those doors in Pakistan. Yes, he is. Hallelujah. Because nothing can hinder his eternal purposes. Hallelujah. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. He said, and the poor shall rejoice in it. The poor are those of us. The church seems so insignificant, so weak in these last days. But oh, no, no, no. God said, I founded this church. And the gates of hell shall never prevail. Never. I founded this church. 
Folks, I'm not talking about Times Square Church. I'm talking about his body. Can you take it home with you tonight? And can you take this everywhere you go at your job and everything else? I serve a God who founded a church. His church is Zion. No Osama bin Laden, no militants, no Islamics, no religion in the world is going to stand up against the cross of Jesus Christ. We are going to be victorious through the blood of the shed lamb of God. Said blood of the Lamb of God. Oh, dear. Touch not my anointed. Do my prophets no harm. Glory to God. Let's stand. Mm. Folks, I'm ready to fight. On my knees, on my knees, I am ready to do battle. I'm ready, I, I'm, I'm ready to do battle for the President of the United States, that God build a wall around him and give him advisors now who know the Word of God. I know, I know that Ashcroft is a born-again, spirit-filled believer who knows his Bible. I'm praying God give him at least one hour alone with the president and get his Bible out and show him the danger we're in. Folks, if he does that, we not only lose the terrorist war, but we go into chaos. But I make you a promise from the word of God, knowing what he says, in a time even of chaos, the greatest open doors the gospel has ever known they will have, we will have principals begging us to come into the schools. Schools will have, they will be falling on their knees and repenting in schools all over the nation. People will be ready to hear like they have never before. And God will give you all the food. He, he, now, he's not going to keep you in uh, luxuries, but he said, he, he said, you'll never have to beg for bread. You're not going to have to wear a gas mask. No, you're not. You've got better protection than that. <laughs> you see, th there's something down deep in my heart that says, come what may. <laughs> the devil can't kill me. He can't kill you without God's permission. <laughs> and, if, and if God permits it, instant glory, instant glory. Instant glory. You tell me if you would trade this. You're walking down the streets of New York and you're going on the way to the job and something takes your life and suddenly you step off uh, 8th Street and suddenly you're in glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The Holy Spirit is trying to take fear out of our hearts. He's taking fear out of our hearts. He's taking all fear out of my heart. I have to preach with judgment, but I have no fear, and He doesn't want you to have fear. And that's going to be a testimony to everybody around you. It is when, when they ask you, why aren't you so... Downcast like everybody else. You got all kinds of open doors then. Hallelujah. Uh, Father, we've, we've been walking softly before you in this church. We've been pleading with you to show us what to do next and where to go and how to do it. Because we don't know how to go out and come in among the people. And Lord, we, we don't know your mind until you speak clearly to us. And we have to have that knowledge and that, that word from the Lord. You said there'll be a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. And Lord, I ask you to comfort the hearts of your people, how you love your people. God, there's not anybody in this house that you don't dearly love. 
even the sinner tonight, you're reaching out to love and saying, come, embrace me, and I'll put my arm around you and I'll keep you from falling. I'll keep you in the dark age, or dark nights that are coming. In the annex, if the Holy Spirit's stirring your heart, and you say, Pastor Dave, I, I just don't feel right. I, I can't find peace. Could be that God's dealing with you about something in your life. Could be that there's something in the way of God's peace and blessing coming. There's something blocking it. Could be something God's talking to you about as He's laying His hand on a sin. I speak to this congregation also in this auditorium. It could be something that's hindering you from having peace. He, he said that uh, wickedness hinders peace. There's no question about it. anything that's wicked in our hearts hinders peace. You cannot have total peace until you to lay everything down at His feet and say, Jesus, Forgive me. I confess it. And I give it to you. Send the Holy Ghost now and empower me to live an overcoming life. I'm going to open this altar right now. We're going to go to prayer in uh, just a bit. But if God's been speaking to you, feel the tug of the Holy Spirit in the annex. Just go to room 206. You're facing 206. Just go, I think, to your right there into room 206. And just kneel down and talk to Jesus. You don't have to.